Hey church family, welcome to Cornerstone. I'm Brandon Byeth, discipleship and young adult pastor, and I'm excited for us to worship and pursue God's presence together today. Whether you've been coming for a while or today's your first visit, on campus or online, we're so glad that you're joining us. If you're a visitor, we would love to connect with you and help you find community. For all our in-person guests, we have connect cards in the seat back in front of you. You can fill out the card and bring it to the info center in the lobby for a welcome gift after the service. Our info center volunteers are also available to help anyone with questions or ways to connect with our community. If you are a guest watching online, visit the helpful connection links below this video. We would love to hear from you. Cornerstone, we believe in the importance and the power of prayer. Whether it be a request or a praise report, we want to come alongside you in speaking directly with God. If you want to pray with the whole church family, we have whiteboards in the hallway where you can write out your prayers. If you need someone to pray over you today, there's a dedicated prayer room with volunteers available to hear your story. Even if you're online, we have a pastor waiting to pray with you in real time or reach out on our website link below. No matter how you share your need, your prayer requests will be specifically prayed for and handled confidentially. We believe that another way we worship God is by giving back a portion of what He has so generously given to us. Your financial support allows our church to better serve God and serve others, both here in our local community and throughout the world. If you're new or visiting, your gift to us is you being here today. But if you call Cornerstone your church home and have come prepared to give, we have several opportunities for you to give as shown on the screen. We can't thank you enough for your faithful giving. As you can see, God is doing some awesome things here at Cornerstone. We'd love for you to jump in and be a part of it. Worship is going to begin soon, so take a few seconds to focus your attention on the Lord. Thanks again for being with us today. Well, good morning, everyone. If I have not had the privilege to meet you yet, my name is Billy Joe. I'm a part of the Women's Connection Team. And whether you are here in our sanctuary, you're joining us in the loft, or if you're part of our online community, we are so thankful that you are with us today. Our prayer is that you feel the love of Jesus throughout this service. If this happens to be your very first time that you're with us, I just wanna give a special welcome to you. We are so glad that you are here with us. We love that you're taking time to get to know us as a church and we would love the opportunity to get to know you just a little bit better as well. There's a really easy way that you can do that. In the seat back in front of you, you'll see a Connect card. If you would take just a moment to fill out that card, and then after the service, you can either drop it in one of our collection boxes outside any of the doors, or you can take it to our info center in the lobby. There will be a volunteer there who will personally welcome you to our church, answer any questions that you might have, and they have a gift for you just as our way of saying that we're so glad that you're with us and we hope that you'll join us again. You know, we are living in a very pivotal time, a time when we have an opportunity and we have, you know, the, that burden upon us to make a difference. And Pastor Don is gonna come up and he's gonna share about an opportunity that we have as a church family. Hello, church. Boy, it's good to be with you to worship today. Um, I just want to talk to you for a minute about something that's always been very, for the last 40 years, it's been a priority in my life, and that is the whole issue of life. And uh, I don't, I never thought I would live long enough to see one of the major political parties having a van or a, a truck on the, at the steps of their convention to give out free abortions like it was candy or something. Breaks my heart. And uh, the March for Life 
is on uh, September 23rd and, and going to Harrisburg. We're going to do something this year because it's clear now that America has it plunges deeper <laughs> into secularism. Uh, it's that the pro-life community is no longer a majority that has a lot of political power. But I believe there's power, but I believe it's in heaven. So we're going to go to Washington. We're going to go to Harrisburg in March, uh, but we're not going to go into the Capitol. We've had folks that have always helped us before. Some of our people have been so helpful to get us a room where we can meet with representatives and so on. We're not going to win that battle with representatives anymore. So I think the only thing left for us to do is the thing we ought, ought to do, and that is go over their head and talk to the real boss. You know, who knows who the whole real boss is? We have God in charge. And so we're going to march in the march, but instead of going into the Capitol building, we're going to go to the side of it, stay outside, and we're just going to pray our guts out. I'm sorry, I don't know how else to say this, but pray with all of our might uh, for life for America to turn back to life because I'll tell you if we shed the innocent blood of our own children we will not have the blessing of God I'll guarantee you that and so I'm going to be going to Washington to Harrisburg I keep saying Washington we went to Washington for years this year we go to Harrisburg to the state uh, march for life on the 23rd of September I would love to fill at least one bus maybe two to go there and to march with me and to pray with me and to lift this whole thing of the direction of our, the, the life of our children and the direction of our country before the Lord. If you're willing to go with me, there's a table in the lobby. You'll see a picture of the Capitol building. It's easy to find. Uh, if you can buy your own ticket, it's great. If you can't, maybe there's some of you who can't go, but you could give a scholarship. We'll put the people who are available with the scholarship, and that'll work. But uh, we need to... Uh, there's never been a more important time for us to stand for life. As there's less of us, it's more important for those of us there is to say, no, this is what's right because this is what the, every life is valuable because we're made in the image of God. That's what the church understands that the world doesn't understand. That's why we need to stand. So if you can go with me, sign up in the lobby, and uh, we'd love to uh, travel to Harrisburg with you that day. Thank you for hearing me. God bless you. Amen. You know, the Bible says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray. Then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. This is our time, church. Let's stand up and be heard. Now, it's hard to believe, but Cornerstone is going to become a much, much busier place in just the next few weeks. In two weeks, we're gonna be kicking off our fall programming. All the details are in the bulletin. And so we're gonna be kicking off our Wednesday nights at Cornerstone with everything from, uh, for things of, from kids of all ages through adults. We're gonna be kicking off our men's and women's Bible studies, the meet during the week, and all of those details are in the bulletin and we hope that you join us. Now next, this past week, excuse me, was one of my favorite weekends of the entire year. We had our uncommon weekend and it was absolutely amazing. You know, our shirts and our tagline for Uncommon is be the blessing and you most certainly were because over 450 of you went out and completed more than 100 projects in our community. You were the hands and feet of Jesus and you brought his love to life and it was incredible to watch. There were teams that went out and prayed with each homeowner and there was a difference that was made and I believe it's going to ripple into eternity. So I wanna thank all of you for your hard work and for just being Jesus with skin on to our community. Right now, I hope that you enjoy this recap video of this past weekend. Hi, Cornerstone. I'm Steve Fitzgerald, site coordinator for several years at Cornerstone. As many of you know, something truly special happened here last weekend, Uncommon Weekend. It's that time when we pause our regular services to step out into our community and make a real difference. Uncommon Weekend isn't just about gathering at the church. It's about being the church. We spread out across our neighborhoods, serving one another, and truly becoming the hands and feet of Jesus. It's our opportunity to put our faith into action and show love in a tangible way. 
There's something amazing about stepping outside the building and into the community. You get to see your faith in action like never before. You meet new people, hear their stories, and witness firsthand how a simple act of kindness can make such a huge difference in someone's life. Whether it was painting a house, delivering food, or simply spending time with someone in need, every single effort made a lasting impact. This year, we had over 450 volunteers working on more than 100 home sites and service projects. Each volunteer brought their unique gifts and talents, and it was incredible to see how God used each person in a special way. From small acts of service to bigger projects, every contribution mattered. Together, we showed our community that faith is more than just words. It's about stepping out and making a difference. And most importantly, God was glorified as we all went out and served Him. We were able to shine His light in so many different ways, and we're excited to see how these seeds of love and service will continue to grow. Pretty awesome, right? Yeah, come on, we can clap. Being the hands and feet of Jesus is amazing, right? Come on, let's stand up. We're going to worship this morning. Do you see?
is so good, amen? Lord, we just worship you this morning.
you, God, for never getting tired, for never stop running after me. Yes, Lord. Oh, oh, you keep blowing my mind every time, every time I turn around. Keep blowing my mind every time, every time I turn around. Keep blowing my mind more mercy, more miracles. Every time I turn around, keep blowing my mind with beauty. Your love is every time I turn around. Your love is better than life. I can't even wrap my mind around it. One day, here in your house, better than a thousand elsewhere. Your love keeps on running, running. Thank you, Lord, for never stop running after us. Yes.
our praise. God, we thank you that you are sitting on your throne, high and exalted with all authority over earth and over all of heaven. I thank you that through your son, Jesus, that we have full access to you, that in this moment we are sitting before you, before the throne. We give you the things that we're carrying, the things that are burdening us, the things that we're grateful for, we just give you all the praise in this place today. It's in your son's holy name we say, amen. Come on, can we give the Lord another hand today? He is worthy, he is all powerful, he is glorious, amen. <laughs> well, it's great worshiping with you guys here today. My name's Kaylee, if you don't know me, I'm one of the worship leaders here at Cornerstone and I'm just so glad that you've come and joined us today. And um, before you're seated, why don't you say hi to a couple people, introduce yourself if you've never met them and go ahead and grab a seat. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. I'm Jenny Marsalise, the Children's Ministry Director. And this summer, we did a fun little skit during kids camp that we thought we would share with you this morning because one thing we all know is something we have in common is we wanna see everybody who is lost be reached. So we really wanna reach the lost. Fallen? Kids in Black Tees presents Luke 15, 10. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And we pray there's lots of rejoicing in heaven. How many of you know we have great kids here? Awesome. Great kids, doing a great job. That was wonderful, so praise God for that. Uh, you know, we just finished Uncommon. Billy Jean kind of gave you, a, Billy Joe, I mean, kind of gave you an update. Uh, but uh, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you as a church. Over the last couple weeks, um, I had updated the figure. Um, Kat, Carlene has told me that, um, you know, what, what happened was, we, we got the number that officially signed up, but what would happen, we would go to a site, and the neighbors would come out and say, what are you doing? And they'd say, oh, I'll help, and they'd jump in, and then others had registered, but they didn't register the kids, they, but we count kids, and we put them in, it's over 600 of you who joined us for Uncommon, and you went to 117 different sites. Isn't that a tremendous thing? And it's, it's a great thing that you did. You know, the real numbers are kept in heaven. We don't know how many people who, who has kind of turned the church off because of something that happened a long time ago or whatever. You know, the, those walls that we put around our heart, 
they get torn down when people are kind to us and when they come in Jesus' name and do th things for us that we couldn't quite do ourselves. And so we won't know until we get to heaven the great effect of all that you do. But I can, I do know this. God was at work. He was at work through you. And I'm just so proud of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to each one who's, uh, who came and served. You know, I love the picture when I... I drove around the first day. My biggest assignment was the second day. The first day I drove around and just kind of encouraged people. But our kids are learning this is how you do church, that this is what we ought to do. And, and so to build that into the next generation is, is so exciting to me. So I, I just want to say thank you, thank you so much from my own heart. I'm, as your pastor, I'm so proud of you for the way we did Uncommon this year. It was a tremendous success. But today we start a new series. And just as we did Uncommon, showing that we are willing to give our all to Jesus to run that second mile, um, but this now we're going to start to talk about in common. Uncommon is what separated us from the world, but in common, I want to ask you this. Look around at you here today. I want you to understand that we're an intergenerational church. Nobody looked around. Is your neck hurt or what? <laughs> now look around. You see kids. You see older folks. You see people in the middle. You, you see people turning 50, uh, all, of, all of these different groups of people. And people drive. It's, it's always amazed to me when I meet people, especially in membership class and other settings like that, people that drive 40 minutes, 45 minutes to get here. Uh, it's, it's tremendous. So why? Why would you drive past 100 churches to get here? What is it about us that, that makes uh, people come? Why, why do we come? Because we're different age groups. We have diverse interests. You know, don't tell anybody, but there are even a couple Dallas Cowboy fans that come to church here. <laughs> we'll convert them, but still working on that. But you know, I'm just telling you, it's such a diversity. So what brings us together? I want to tell you what brings us together. It's what we believe. We are united by what we believe. We are a people who acknowledge, first of all, that we are sinners saved by grace. And we are followers of Christ who believe that Christ was God become a man to save us from our sin. Believe that God saved us through Jesus Christ taking our place on the cross. And we have placed our faith and our hope of eternity totally with him. We believe God saved us not only from our sin... But he saved us for a purpose. One of the glorious things about being a Christian is when I read the book, I see that he equipped us with different gifts and talents and abilities that we to, are to use within his church and within the world. And if, if when we all come together and put our gifts together, it's amazing the things that we can accomplish for God when we do that. And so it says in, in Ephesians 2, verse 10, that God prepared an advance before he made each of us. He, he prepared, prepared in advance things, works for us to do in his kingdom. And we can make a difference because the neat thing about working in the kingdom of God is you not only make a difference for now, but you can change eternal destinies by the way that you follow God. And so... It's we, well, the thing that brings us together is our shared faith. It's, the, it's this faith that we have in common. It knits us together. It's our belief in Jesus and what he did that makes us church. Now, starting today and for the next seven weeks, we're going to look at the seven things that I think we must do if we're going to be a church that pleases God. And uh, I believe that both the... I, I, and we're, uh, we have these, you'll see them around the church, these seven values, we call them, but we're going to talk about each one. It's going to be sort of like, you know, if we were looking for a new senior pastor, these are things we'd want him to believe, to believe and acknowledge. So we're going to kind of make that clear right up front that this is who we are and what we're about. And so I'm going to do that, but first I want to just say something to you about the church as a whole before we look at the seven values. You know, I had my first lesson in the doctrine of the church when I was 12 years old. I think that's 63 years ago. I was in confirmation class, about six of us in that confirmation class with Reverend Gilliland. We met in his office, and it was at the First Methodist Church in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. Go Groundhogs. And uh, <laughs> before we took our vows, Reverend Gilliland read these words from the Methodist Church's Book of Worship. 
at that time, it was an incredible statement. Look at this. This is out of the book of worship um, of the Methodist Church. Dearly beloved, the church is of God. It's not ours. It's God's. He made it. And will be persevered, will preserve for the end of time. The church is going to be here until Jesus comes back. For the conduct of worship. The due administration of God's word and sacraments. We come to worship God. We come, we take communion to remember what he did for us. And, and also we learn God's word and grow here. The maintenance of Christian fellowship. We build into each other's lives. The, and discipline. When things need corrected, they can be. And the edification of believers. This is the, how we grow and become mature in our faith. And they, look at these. These are the two points I want you to grab most of all. For the conversion of the world, all and every station stand in need of the means of grace which it alone survives. Conversion of the world and for everyone. That's a big job. Do you ever think about that? We think of church as just a little thing, but that statement is incredible. It says that, that God has left us with the job of bringing the gospel to the whole world. Everybody needs what Jesus gives, and that means we're his agents. You see, when Jesus came and died on the cross, he was paying for our sins, but nobody knew it but 120 people in an upper room. And he wanted the whole world to know that they could have eternal life if they just put their hope and faith and trust in him. And so everybody of every age needs it, and it's conversion of the world to Jesus. That's what the church is about, and that's what we're here to do, and that's what we must never forget. Not long after I had digested this as a 12-year-old so much, I just remember thinking, wow. The church is more important than I ever thought. And I began to have an appreciation, and I think that grew over the years in my life. But then after reading, after reading that, I, I read a verse that also kind of fit in with what I was learning as a 12-year-old. As a I learned that Jesus' church is not mine. Jesus said he would build his church. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is so much wonderful doctrine in here that we need to get a hold of. First of all, it's never my church. It's always his church. If you want your own church, here's what you have to do. First, you have to live a perfect life. How many are already disqualified? And then you've got to give that life for those who have sinned. Then here's the tricky part. you got to rise from the dead. And after you've done that, you can have your own church. But until then, we have the blood of Jesus Christ, and we have a blood-bought faith. He paid for our, for our salvation by his death on the cross, and that's why he can say to us, I will build my church. This is the church of Jesus Christ. And that's says incredible thing that we need to get a hold of is that it's his church. And when we forget that, the church turns inward and the spirit lifts and the church dies. And then it says that Jesus is in the building business. He said, I will build my church. Not a coincidence that when he came to earth, he, what was his, he, God put him in a family where the stepdad was a carpenter. <laughs> And Jesus was going to build a church, and he learned it while he was building tables and chairs and things out of wood. And see, so he built his church. And, you know, there's an analogy there. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it, it, it says this. As for you, talking about Christians now, you are these living stones rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves are like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter's saying, here's an analogy. Just as you build a, he said, imagine that we're building a church, but we're going to build it out of people instead of out of stones. You're this living stone. And Jesus is the cornerstone, and around him we become part of this living church that he is putting together, and uh, it, that's a great analogy. And then he says this. 
Um, go back to, um, can, can you go back to there? He says, I, I want you to get a hold of this. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's two great lessons here that we can't just skip over. I just need to ask you, because we don't talk about it. We're always afraid we're going to scare somebody off so we never tell them the truth. How many believe in a literal hell? Three of you. That's a, I think there's more. Jesus said, there's a place called hell. How many believe in judgment? Do you understand at the end of the age there's a judgment? The Bible says that every person will stand individually before God and give an account. It says there are books in heaven. That mine's bigger than an encyclopedia book set. For you younger people, you'll have to ask your parents what an encyclopedia is. But it, it's not on the internet. Uh, hell's a real thing, Jesus said. And it's where people go who don't know Jesus. And, and we just need to start to say that out loud because, because that's what Jesus said. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. He said, this is a real place. There was going to be a judgment. And if your sins haven't been paid for on the cross by Jesus, you're going to have to pay for them yourself. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. But God is just. And that's why we get to choose between the grace of God given to us by Jesus taking our place and paying our own way, which is torment forever. I, I, I'm so glad Jesus paid for my salvation. But there's still the gates of hell. And when he's talking about the gates of hell here, he says, they shall not prevail. And that's the other great lesson in this little verse that you don't have to be old to learn. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail. The implication there, do you get this? The implication there is that we were born into a world where there is a spiritual battle. Do you understand that there is good and there is evil? There, are, there is, without a doubt, Goes going, we're, we're living in a world where it's struggling. I watch evil being called good and good being called evil. I'm watching the devil seem to be having a great time these days. But it says that in the end, the devil will not prevail. But the Lord Jesus would. And then I learned one more great verse. It's out of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. It says, to, G, to God be the glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. The church ought to be a place of glory. And I think we need to pray every Sunday when you come to church. When you walk into the door. My wife said to me this morning. She said, there's a great spirit in this place today. She just felt the presence of God as soon as she walked into the building. Let's you and I live our lives in such a way. That when we come together collectively for the, for the weekend, that we sense the glory and the presence of God. And then I learned that there are things for the church to do. I learned that uh, when God saves us, he saves us to do good works. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says that God prepared, prepared in advance good works for each of us to do. Christians ought to have good works. They ought to have things that we do that make a difference, hopefully an eternal difference, because we uh, are filled with his spirit. So over the next um, seven weeks, starting today, I want to go over these seven keys that we have on what I believe a church must do to be a church that God will use and bless. And the first one is uh, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. I read this verse like it's a resume. It's like Jesus saying, this is why I came. Remember who Jesus is. He talks about the Son of Man. That's interesting. This is out of Daniel chapter 9, this title, Son of Man. But when Jesus came and he, when he was speaking, when he was referring to himself, he would always call himself the Son of Man. And the reason is, as I said in Daniel 7, it talks about, it's a messianic verse. It talks about the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Do you know one day the eastern sky is going to open? Do you believe that? And Jesus is going to return. He's coming back. Turn to your neighbor who missed that and say, tell him, he, Jesus is coming back. Yeah. All right. I hope it isn't based on your enthusiasm. <laughs> 
He is coming back, and it's getting closer. And as the world becomes more degenerative, the more that we need to know that he's coming, and our hope is in the Lord. So, when it, so Jesus uses this title that's very much a mis, messianic title to refer to himself. He says, when, when I'm coming back, I, can't, I, I said, this is who I am, and I'm coming back. But for now, here's why I've come this first time. I've come to seek and to save the lost. The Bible says, without Jesus, we're lost. Wow. People need Jesus, and they need him now. And so if there had been another way, you see, God wants us with him in heaven. He made us in his image. He made us as a spiritual being as well as a physical being. He made us so we could commune with God, so we could fellowship with God. That's, that's how he put us together. And now sin has broken that line of communication, that part of God being with us and God speaking to us and us hearing him. So Jesus came because there wasn't any other way. Do you know if each of us could have sacrificed a thousand sheep a day for the rest of eternity... God would have done it rather than send Jesus. But the fact is, it took Jesus becoming a human being. And then that human being living a perfect life. And then giving that life as the sacrifice to pay for our sins. When Jesus died on the cross, he made the full sufficient sacrifice to pay for your sins and my sins. And of the sins of everyone who would believe. That's what happened. And that's what Jesus did. And so he said, my purpose in coming this first time, even though I'm the Messiah, I'll be back. But when, this time I have come on a search and save mission that lost people, people who are not saved because they don't know Jesus yet, that they can find in him the salvation that they need. And so this is the first thing that the church must do. No one else will do this. You know, we're going to talk in a few minutes about helping the hurting. There are a lot of non-Christian organizations, a lot of wonderful people who are not saved but who have a heart and want to help hurting people. But I want to tell you, the task of evangelism, the task of bringing people to Jesus, only the church is going to do that. Only the church is going to understand what needs done and do it. And so uh, when I read this passage, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, I see this as the most important thing that the church must do. We've got to do evangelism. This is the thing we need to do a better part of. And it isn't as hard as you think. Sometimes evangelism is as easy as inviting your neighbor or getting the kids out of bed and saying, we're going to church. It could be as easy as, as just starting a friendship with someone that opens the door where you can share the gospel. And we need to all be more sensitive to those things because this is so important. People are going to be somewhere forever. And if they aren't in heaven, I don't like the alternative. And Jesus didn't either. And he was not content to be back in heaven with the Father after his resurrection to be in, in communion there. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to save you, and he came to save me. And then the, thir the second thing that we are called to do is to help the hurting. Man, we live in a broken world, don't we? And the way that that broken world affects people, I, I, I try to be faithful to read the prayer boards in the hall that you can sign. And I probably get there three days a week and just stand there for a few minutes and look at all the ways our people are hurting and praying for them. And when I do, I'm, I, 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 you would think by now, nothing would shock me. But man, so many of you are hurting in so many different ways. We need to help the hurting. You know, I see your heart. I see the heart of unsaved people. And usually, there's a, there's a wall around it inside of you. There's a wall around that wall about your heart. It's, it's built of sometimes of bitterness and disappointment, sometimes injustice, sometimes physical illness. But there's a way that God hasn't done what we expected him to do, and we just kind of build up a wall. But I found that if the church is kind, see, it's a lot harder to be 
It's a lot harder to live around here and be critical of the church today than it was before Uncommon this weekend. Because people, when they see people helping, they want nothing back but to just, just share the love of God that people are responsive to that. It, it isn't evangelism, it's pre-evangelism. It tears down the things that keep people from receiving God. And that's, that's what they have to do. So helping the hurting. Listen, back in the 60s, as the church began to go astray, as the church started to become apostate, as the church started to say, we don't really believe the Bible, we don't really believe in heaven, we don't really believe in hell, we don't believe in, in God becoming a man and dying on a cross, and, and as, they, as they started to tear down the orthodoxy, then what they had to do was find some reason to exist, and so they just said, we'll do good works, we'll do good works, we'll do good works, but everyone's going to go to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that. And so when they, when, they, when they got that way, they did a lot of stuff, but they never talked about winning salvation. And so I think there's two things we have to put together, number one and number two. We have to understand Jesus came to seek and to save the lost by paying for our sins. And when you can put that together with the good works that we do, when we take good works and when we take trust in Jesus for our save, as our Savior, that's when the church can impact the next generation and the rest of us mightily. God becomes mighty in his works for us when we put together winning the lost and helping the hurting. It's amazing how that opens the door for God to work. And then we, we can talk about impacting the next generation. Um, we're always a one generation away from extinction. And the fact is that the world has worked awfully hard to turn the hearts of many of our kids, even kids that grew up in good churches, to turn them away from God. They, they, through secularism, which is so rampant in our culture that people don't believe much of anything. And so the church has to be more intentional about the re reaching the next generation than perhaps they've often been. We... we, we when you look at our budget as a church, one thing we wanted to do was to be very generous in spending the money we need to spend to see our kids in heaven. Isn't that, isn't that what you would want us to do? To, to work in such a way we'll see our kids in heaven? And so it's really important. Next week, Pastor uh, Brandon is going to speak on how to impact the next generation. I thought he might know more about that than I do. So he's going to speak to that next week. And then I'm going to do these other ones around it. But the impact the next generation, the church must be intentional about speaking into the soft hearts of our kids before the world hardens their hearts. Then we have to find pathways for growth. It isn't enough to just get saved. But once you get saved, you need to grow. Once you've been born again, you need to be working on growth. And that's why we have so many places where you can study, so many places where you can share, so many uh, groups, small groups and, and study groups and so forth. You can see them in their bulletin today because there's several of them lined up to start in two weeks. And you need to be a part of a group of people who are studying God's Word together and growing. And then we... Uh, then we need to glorify God. Long term, this is the most important thing on the list, is that's why God made us, to glorify and worship him forever. But, you know, we're kind of in the emergency room station where this is something we do, but we've got to reach the lost, and then, and then the glory will come. And then we have to touch the world. I'm so excited. When we get to this point, point uh, when we're going through and looking at these all in, in greater depth, I, there's been some incredible things that you funded in Zimbabwe and in Kenya. And I just haven't had a venue to share that, but I'm going to share that. What's going on in Zimbabwe right now that you've had a hand in is absolutely revolutionary. And uh, it's amazing what, how God is working. And uh, so we're going to touch the world. That, uh, Jesus died for the whole world. I mean, think about this. He's getting ready to go back into heaven. He's got his 11 disciples left there. And he says, go into the whole world and preach the gospel. There's 11 of them. They didn't even have a bicycle, much less a car. And they're supposed to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. You know, if you take out Judas, who betrayed him, and John, who died in exile, and you have the other 10 disciples, you know, none of them died in the country they were born in. They had all gone out 
Thomas to, got to India. Think of that. Matt, Mark got to the end of Ethiopia. Uh, all these, all these guys, they left home. They were martyred in other countries because Jesus said, take it to the whole world. And we have to be a church that sees that God's called each, each church to touch the world. Finally, we need to love each other. <laughs> the rest of these things don't matter at all if we give the church a black eye by the way we treat each other. You know, the word is used here in John 13, 34, the word commandment. You know, if you're talking to Jewish people and you talk about a commandment, that's a big deal. Now, you can talk about a law. Moses came down with a whole bunch of laws, hundreds of them, but only 10 commandments. And when Jesus is ready to leave, he says, I'm going to give you an 11th commandment. Put this on the level of the whole Ten Commandments. And what is it? It says this. Look, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I've loved you, you have to love each other. It's if, if he'd have just said, now, guys, be nice to each other and love each other. Will you do that? And everybody say, okay. That's not what he said. He said, I want you to use the way that I love you as I give my life on the cross for you. I want that to be the yardstick by which you judge the way you love each other. And frankly, if the church doesn't love each other, if people don't see us caring for each other, giving grace to each other, serving each other, then, you know, it's, uh, they'll not do any of the other things we've mentioned. So this new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you, that's the standard. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, the mark of Christians has to be the way we treat each other. And so that's the, uh, that's the seven things. And uh, as I started today, we're doing Reaching the Lost. But over the next seven weeks, we'll be covering all of those. And I hope that you'll internalize those in the days and years ahead. Over these next weeks, we're going to look at them in great detail. But first and most important one is this Luke 10, 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And I told you that Son of Man he's, is how Jesus referred to himself because he wanted people to understand why they, on this first coming, on this first coming, he was coming not as the Messiah King who would sit on David's throne, but he was coming as the sacrifice that would pay for our sin. But he wants you to know that he's coming back, and that's why he used the phrase Son of Man which comes out of the Old Testament as a messianic word. It's as the Son of Man will come in the clouds. This is be the second coming of Christ. Understand that that was his thing. Jesus left the glories of heaven to save us. And people without Jesus are lost. I want you to look at John 14, 6, because I don't see any way around this verse. If I'm going to be a Bible-believing Christian, I have to believe this. It says to them, Jesus is speaking, and he says to his disciples, this is Thursday night. He's going to get arrested later in the evening. The next day, he's going to die for us, and he's talking about really important things. He talked about new commandment, but he said this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And then he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Church, it would be easy to lay this aside and we could just have church and be nice. But Jesus said, Jesus said that the only way to heaven is through him. Think about that. Do you see the pressure that puts on us? I, th I mean, you know, God's so sovereign. He can use anyone. But I want you to understand that we need to see people as saved or needing to be saved. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord, you need to deal with that before you leave today. And then if you have, then you need to understand the people you love, your family, the people you work with, your children, or some, for some children, your parents, they need Jesus too. And we need to be a people who understand that everybody needs Jesus. There's no way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. And if we believe the Bible... We must believe that. We can't water that down. We can't ignore it. We've got to understand that God has us here in this world to win people for Christ. Jesus is the way. But how do I connect to him? Okay, okay. You get it in my head. 
that I need Jesus. What do I do? How do I do that? Do I have to do a bunch of works? Do I have to give a bunch of money? Do I have to work in the nursery? I mean, what do I have to do to get connected with Jesus as my Savior and my Lord that I know that I know that I have eternal life? Well, I think one of the clearest passages in the Bible to tell us how to become saved, how to make Jesus our Savior and Lord, is Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where it says, by grace you've been saved. Boy, this this little paragraph is just full of Bible words. Grace is a huge word. Grace is being given something you don't earn and something you don't deserve. It's not your paycheck at the end of the month. It's when someone just generously gives you something. And that's what God does. By grace, we are saved. Not that we've done anything, but just because God is gracious and kind and good, he chose to save us. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. Here's what God does, grace. Here's what we do. We just believe. We believe. We put our hope and faith and trust. When we get to the gate of heaven, we'll say to God, I'm not coming in because I'm worthy. I'm coming in because Jesus is my representative and he paid for my sin. And in the power of Jesus, I'll be in heaven. Do you get that? Don't try to earn it. The Bible says we're to do good works, but we don't do them to earn heaven. We do them because we love God and we want to serve him. And so it's really important. By grace have we been saved through faith. It's not our own doing. It's a gift from God with not a result of works so that no one can boast. No one can get to heaven and say, boy, is God lucky I came. No. When we get to heaven, we're going to be God's example. He's going to show the angels how gracious he is by pointing to us and saying, look, I let them in. <laughs> and that's, that's so you know how gracious I am. So I'm asking you, have you ever had a time when you went to the Lord Jesus, you went to God and you said, God, I'm a sinner saved by grace. You know what I've done. I also believe that Jesus died because I sinned. And I ask him to come into my heart to forgive my sins, to be my Savior, and to be my Lord. That prayer, just that simple, opens the door of heaven. And you can leave with certitude in your heart that you are an eternal being that will be in a glorious place with God forever. I don't know any better news than that. That's why they call the gospel good news. And I just, before we talk about reaching others, I'd like you to do a check do a heart check and ask, have I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior? I'll tell you what. Why don't we pray that prayer I just kind of prayed together again. And if you've never made Jesus your Savior, this is an opportunity. So repeat after me. Father God, I thank you that you're a, great, a God of grace. And I'm so thankful that Jesus died on the cross for me. And Lord Jesus, I come to you today. And Father, I ask you to take his death on the cross as payment for my sin. God, send your Holy Spirit to dwell in my heart. And help me to live with this new start as your child. Give me the gift of eternal life. Amen. Guys, walk that out. Walk that out. Every day, start the day by telling God you're so thankful that Jesus opened the door of heaven for you. And then understand that you become his ambassador, representative. People are going to judge God once you claim to be a Christian. People are going to judge God by your contact, by, by, your, by the way you act, by the, by the way they see you. They, if they need to see Jesus in you, and we need to live a life that points people to him because he gave his life for us. I'm done with the notes. Let's pray. Church, I want to tell you I love you. I love each one of you. And when I get to heaven, I want to see you there. 
And the devil will do everything he can to block the way. But I want to see you in heaven. And so I'm asking you to please, I, 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 want, I'm, I want you to share what I know God has died to give us. And I want you to be a part of what he has pre prepared for us for eternity. And so I'm just making sure that you make sure. Because I'm going to tell you, not only is the devil going to win and you're going to lose if you don't trust Jesus, but I'm going to be really mad at you because I want you in heaven with us. Father God, take this prayer we prayed. Take it, Lord, and use it in each heart and life to make it certain that we have an eternity with you forever. I ask this, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.